Summer of Soul, or When the Revolution Cannot Be Televised, as it's known through its subline. This is a music documentary directed by Questlove. It is about the 1969 Harlem Cultural Festival. Both Will and I saw this at Sundance, and it's one of my favorite movies of the year. I believe you enjoyed it as well, Will, because you did see it, right? I'm not misremembering that. Yeah, no, actually, I think I saw it a little before you did, because you caught it at the end of the festival, if I'm not I mistaken. Think so, yeah. And I caught it, I think that was like maybe first film on the second day. So that was like one of the first films I saw, and it was uh, a good way to start the festival. I'll say that. I'm happy to see that it is now getting a limited theatrical release so people can actually go see this in theaters. I really want to. It hit limited release on June 25th. It expanded this past weekend. Searchlight, the company that used to be Fox but is now owned by Disney, is currently distributing the film. And if you can't see it in a theater that's not playing in your area, you can also watch it on Hulu right now. And like I said, critics are really liking this. And I think the reason people like this is because there's a really good story behind this movie. I think people really like it when they get clued in or reminded of something that's been like forgotten to history. I think a lot of the successful documentaries have been kind of like that. It's like, oh, here's this thing that like people don't talk about enough that they should. It's such an epic thing. And then if a documentary can kind of sort of relitigate an event and then bring it to a cultural consciousness, I think that it rightfully captures the attention of people who honest who you know people in the industry people who are critics people who want you know information and pop culture to be more aware of certain things so that's kind of the setup for summer of soul in terms of what it's capturing it really is phenomenal because well did did you know about this event at all this this cultural festival going into this movie no i went in pretty cold yeah same here i i had no idea what this was And, you know, as soon as the movie starts, you get a really good sort of like introduction to this was the black Woodstock. But like even saying that kind of feels like reductive, you know, it's like it was its own thing. It was it was something that was this epic music festival back in the days when you could watch a music festival for free. It took place in Mount Morris Park which is located in Harlem. It's now called Marcus uh, Garvey Park. So if you are in New York right now, you won't find it. Um, But this festival went on for six whole weeks. It had a huge, huge attendance. Lots of people came out to see this, and you see it in the archived footage. Uh, But some of the acts include Stevie Wonder, Mahalia Jackson, Nina Simone, who gets like an entire section of this documentary. But then we also have The Fifth Dimension. Mm -hmm. Say again? I said, as well, she should. Of course. I mean, Questlove knows how to pace this documentary. I'll put it that way. The Fifth Dimension is all the staple singers, Sly and the Family Stone, Gladys Knight and the Pips. I mean, watching this movie, if you, I mean, you don't have to be a music junkie to really get the full experience out of this movie. But I, I think like if you are like obsessed with this era, you're gonna, there's a lot to feast on with this. But also, like, what happens around this festival is that it was very obscure. It was the kind of thing that people, that kind of got erased, as a lot of, like, black milestones and, like, black American milestones tend to happen, you know. And this is 1969. This is the summer of the moon landing, right? And all of these other things like that and Woodstock were kind of just, like, you know, being what was propped up at the time where this was just sort of happening out in obscurity like i said but i think that it is wonderful that this footage is finally being released it was i think like a documentary crew was filming it but then they had all of this footage of the festival and it just sat in a closet for decades somehow Questlove got a hold of it and was able to turn it into a movie a long but really satisfying film one of my favorite documentaries in recent years, uh, and I think definitely my favorite documentary of 2021. But Will, what did you think of Summer of Soul? I mean, we we both we we both saw this a while back, but yeah, has it aged well for you after all this time? I would say so. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen it since, but I mean, just thinking back on it, it just the thing that that always sticks with me is just like how warm and celebratory it is, just by design. I mean, you know, obviously. Questlove got lucky with having, you know, this tremendous footage that he found. But I do think generally throughout the film, he does showcase, especially as a first time filmmaker, some adeptness that I think proves that it's not just like he 
you know, hit the jackpot. Not that I mean, obviously he did get lucky, but I mean, there's one scene in particular I remember watching and just being like, okay, like this is like proof that he knows what he's doing, and that's the the scene where we get kind of like the broader culture reaction where. Uh, you know, like the moon landing's happening, but we then cut back to like the festival and we kind of get like this broad scope of like, this is what's happening. It feels like a better version of like what they're trying to do in that one scene in First Man, where like it was kind of yeah. trying to touch on something similar. But like Questlove, I think, gets it down in a way that just like really, I think, crescendos a film in a way it's like, okay, like this is like it puts you in this place and time in a way that doesn't take you out of it, doesn't like feel like it's like invading the the concert footage and stuff it's not like just like and then this is what's going on back to music like it, uh, it flows together in a way that i think is really impressive uh and showcases uh, Questlove's um adeptness as an early filmmaker but by and large it's just like it's a really fun emotionally passionate film that is you know just filled with all these great performances and as you're suggesting it has this like urgency to it where it feels for a lot of obvious reasons like it needs to to be this work of preservation that needs to to be shown and seen to 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 be heard and and finally just realized in this major way being that it's been forgotten for so long and uh, initially when i saw the film i was kind of back and forth on the uh the, the like talking head segments like i felt like they were kind of starting to be like filler at times but i think he really makes it work towards the end when it realizes that like you see the footage of uh people like kind of revisiting the film or seeing it for the first time and just like holding on their faces and just seeing that like joy and sadness and that like sense of discovery and nostalgia in a way that just like really uh it works and i think that that's the stuff that really that sticks with me and i think makes it more than just a really impactful uh concert film it just like this like this work that needs to be preserved and celebrated in a major way. So yeah, a good doc all around. It really is. And I think like it would have been good enough if Questlove had just sort of presented this festival as is kind of packaged it up and been like, it's fun. It's like, Oh, it's this, you know, kind of thing that you haven't really heard about probably like people like us, I suppose. But instead I think that he really frames the context so well in this. And I think like, yeah, like you were saying with first man, it's like, the reason that scene kind of feels out of place is because the rest of the movie isn't about that. So it's kind of like just sort of that to me felt like filler in first man, honestly, of like, Oh yeah, here's, here's also this. And like, I mean, I know what the point of that scene was to sort of be like, man, like all of these obstacles, all of this like public anxiety about the situation and people being like, we shouldn't even doing this. We're wasting the money. Like it does serve a function, but I think yeah. because the rest of the movie is like glorifying and lionizing Neil Armstrong. And <laughs> it's kind of like, right. It's a, it's a different energy. It's a different tone. I think in that film, it felt more conscious, I guess. Like, it's like he just kind of felt like he needed to have that scene in for his, like, exactly, like, uh, yeah. yeah, like, it, like, it felt kind of obligatory in a way that in this film, it's like it's adding to the thesis. It's, it's clearly like it's part, it's a, it's a major function of film. It's like what he's trying to get at broadly throughout this film. And I think obviously that's, that's why it works so much better in this context than it did there. Absolutely. I think that he, he does so well to like like with this context really show like why these people were here what they were celebrating and and you know that sort of like black unity that was on display and i like how the documentary goes to some you know tr tricky places in that respect like i think it was like fifth dimension if i'm not mistaken has that whole section where they felt like maybe they're out of place in this situation like maybe they you know like because their sound isn't like to other people, it doesn't sound black as they describe it, but to them, it's just, it's their music. And there was like some nervousness about getting on stage and performing to all of these people who might not accept them. It was like little moments like that, that really bring this together. We mentioned, of course, the Nina Simone section, which is just like mesmerizing. It's the kind of spellbinding stuff that yeah. I always look for in a really good film. And I, I don't, I can't remember a documentary that sort of had me kind of under a spell like that. Yeah, and I, I liked also this film, because it has the power of the footage, it doesn't have to just be like characters always just talking about like why this artist is great. They can just show you real footage of just the artists in their element and doing, you know, 
some for some of these artists like at their peak you know i got their like uh some of their greatest heights as musicians and you can just like yeah see it and live in that and obviously you know the footage is preserved very well so it feels very crisp and it's easy to feel like living in the moment in a way that uh, is obviously very electrifying and powerful in many respects but then some of the artists are just starting out and so you get to see that too you get to see stevie wonder you know really at like the very beginning i think of his career if i'm not mistaken and yeah, so he's like stuff, uh, early twenties, I think. I yeah, think. he's very maybe, young at that point. Maybe mid. And, yeah, and you know, I've I've had the privilege of seeing him live, and you know, it's a very different you know thing, obviously, because you know, with that experience and you know the way his music has really matured over the years, it's it's just a delight to kind of see such a spontaneous performance from him and this sort of well more of a spontaneous environment i should say i think what sums up this documentary the best and what really made me fall for it head over heels was this really great scene where this guy he he was there when he was a little kid and he's just talking about how he had sort of wondered if this whole thing was like a memory like oh i i I, this maybe this didn't even happen i Mm -hmm. i just dreamed it you know because it was such a transportive experience and like it made me think of like the memories i've had as a kid and i thought that maybe those are dreams but then you get to see his reaction to seeing the footage i mean it's like Mm -hmm. ah that is just good stuff yeah i mean it's like it's almost like deliberate undeliberate form of gaslighting where it just kind of feels like so many great works of art have just like been swept under the rug and either like through the media or just like culturally they just don't get recognized as much and this movie like i was saying before just has that urgency of feeling like it needs to be relived or needs to be preserved or needs to be seen in this fashion to like know that wasn't uh this thing that was forgotten or brushed over over time that it is to be recognized and celebrated and you know it's very uh in some ways simple intent but i think it's also very impassioned and meaningful and uh, it succeeds i think in many different respects i definitely agree and you know you kind of mentioned one of the things that you know maybe irked you a little bit you know and and i don't get the sense that it was necessarily like a deal breaker or anything like that but you know the talking heads and the prevalence of that there were times when it would cut to people talking and i'd be like i kind of just want to see the music please yeah <laughs> like if, there was a bit of that and it it, it did it get just, a little annoying at times yeah i mean just like some stuff towards the beginning just feels a little perfunctory also like just having like kind of just like the like stock black and white footage that like you know it's necessary for establishing it but it doesn't feel like the most inventive or imaginative as far as like uh, uh presenting this this information and what it's trying to say but you know like I said, Questlove's the first time filmmaker. I, I certainly forgive him for that because I think the the heights of film are very high. And I think those are the moments that, that need to be recognized and celebrated. So that's a minor quibble, I think, in the broad scheme of things. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I, I saw it on Twitter, but somebody basically said that when Lin-Manuel Miranda showed up, it's like the one the movie's one jump scare. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I forgot to mention, I did see... Um, the Rita Morano uh, documentary uh, recently. You did catch up and, on that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he was a producer on it. And he just keeps like popping into that film as well. And just, you know, <laughs> at, at one point it was especially egregious because it's talking about like the immigrant experience in like 1910 or like maybe like 1920. And Lynn Moran, Lynn Memo Miranda is just like, yeah, you know, like when you're living in this time, it's just like, Sorry, Lin Manuel Miranda, but you you cannot comment on what it was like to be an immigrant. I just wish somebody would be like, early, "Yeah, this is Harlem, Lin. Like, does this look like Washington Heights to you? No, right? Well, I mean, you Sorry. know, I mean, he didn't really grow in Washington Heights. That's right. Either, right? He grew up yeah, north so, of Washington Heights. Right. Oh man, it was just one of those moments where it's just like you don't have to comment on this, Lin Manuel Miranda. You can just let the movie speak for itself. But yeah he's like i'm just i'm just saying i yeah can i just say this real quick no no it's all right just closing the door kind of slowly um no no hate to lin-manuel miranda over here uh just just pointing that out but yeah i i adored this movie and i want to see it again as soon as possible i can't wait to see this on the big screen if i get a chance to do so it's just it's what documentaries should be i think in every way well produced well managed the editing is really really solid I think that it, it takes you to another place and I think it's going to teach people a lot of things. I think other people, it's going to remind them of something, bring light and truth to something that maybe had been forgotten. 
And it's going to reveal things to people who may have chosen to forgotten or, you know, would have liked to have known a long time ago, which is definitely where I fall. And it's stuff like that. that I, I certainly find so warm about this documentary. And uh, I think you use the worm warm as well, because it's warm. I mean, it's, it's a hot summer movie. I, you know, I, I felt the heat watching that movie in January. And uh, yeah, I just think this one, it hits, it hits all the right notes because it's about music right uh yeah i mean to go one step further it's Not quite flat. a crowd pleaser as a yeah, documentary I yeah i like that um yeah i mean yeah it just it's a very accessible film i, I think it's just it, it has very clear intent it, it knows what's trying to say and communicate but it's also just about having a good time and celebrating the artistry and music and uh and iconography of these many artists and recognizing them like i said either at their heights or soon to be heights uh and it's just a just a damn good time so i'd give it uh, a pretty warm b plus you give it a b plus i give it the a minus i i think this go. one's a must see so i'm going high one of my favorite films of the year for sure i think this is in my definitely in my top 10 right now so definitely go check it out when you have the chance it's a long movie but i think it is very rewarding and i mean you can at least see it on hulu and i think if you have a great sound system you are going to be in for a treat it is 117 minutes long yeah i mean i think it, you know it's worth mentioning that like we saw it at home on our computers yeah. through sundance and i think true. it doesn't rob the experience in any fashion to watch it at home but if you can see it in theaters i'm sure it's an amazing experience Thank you so much for listening to our show. Be sure to subscribe to Cinemaholics on your favorite podcast app of choice or find us on YouTube. See you all next time.